Um, wonderful. Really, really happy to be here. Um, and very excited for Big Day of Giving this year and everything else we're going to be working on. Um, I've spoken on a lot of different topics at these boot camps in the past. Um, so if you've come in the past, I hope I look at least somewhat familiar. Um, I'm going to talk about a topic I have not spoken to at these big dog boot camps before. Um, and it's really around metrics and evaluation, which we're going to get into why we're talking about that for Big Day of Giving and not just as a general thing that people should have on their radar. Um, to get us started, though, I want you just to work with somebody at your table, and I want you to answer these two prompts. I am amazing at something, and I know this because, what are you amazing at, and why do you think, why do you know that you're amazing at that? So find somebody at your table, have a quick conversation, and we'll circle back here in a second. That's it. Okay, um, we're gonna get into why all of this matters, and why we think about this, and what we use as evidence to justify why we think something. Um, I wanna, uh, I want to start with just a high-level conversation, and we can just shoot out some ideas here. Um, why should organizations prioritize metrics and evaluation? Tells you what's working and what's not. Tells you what's working and what's not. What else? Can't measure it, you can't prove it. Can't measure it, you can't prove it. Who are you trying to prove it to? Improve it. Oh, oh if you can't measure it, you can't <laughs> improve it. Thank you. Love it. It's how you get money. It's how you get money. Donations and funders are asking for it. What else? You're not wasting time. You're not wasting time? What do you mean? If you're um, not reaching the people you want and you keep doing the same thing, you're still not going to reach the people you want to reach. And so you need to own in what you're doing to make it most effective. Great. So again, it's very much like how do we get, it's the way you get better at it, both more effective and more efficient on, on both of those. What else? So, Lots of other reasons that I think are very valuable. I, just, I agree with everything you guys said. Um, one of the big ones that actually a lot of, I know a lot of you, and organizations, a lot of organizations in Sacramento are thinking about succession planning. The single best way to navigate succession planning is to just become a far more data-informed organization. Because then it makes it actually very easy to step into that role and you start to see, oh, this is how this thing actually works. When you treat it as like, a, oh yeah, it just has to feel good, it's gotta look this way. Um, it's a much harder thing for a new person to step into. So it helps with succession planning. Um, accountability, right? Why you're doing a certain thing and trying to link it to some actual why you care, why it's important. Um, transparency, a lot of your funders, a lot of your staff, your volunteers, your board, people want to understand what's going on. So actually popping the hood and saying, here's what's working and here's, here's what we know, here's what we're learning, actually brings more people into that conversation in a healthy way. The other thing is we talk about fundraising, storytelling. The stories that you're trying to tell in your organizations, if they're not data informed, they're not anchored in some type of metric, um, you're kind of just like weaving together something you hope is true. But if you actually want to tell your story, and we're going to explain this between the rest of the stuff I'm going to talk about, then Katie's going to um, really start to apply it to the storytelling space. Um, if you want to tell a rich story about your organization that's engaging, that's going to catch people's attention, that's gonna get them to care about what you're doing, you need to have it anchored in metrics. You need to understand the story that your organization is actually telling and figuring out how to put the right frame on that that's gonna catch the right eyes. All right, so we're gonna explain a little bit about how to think through this, but I have three huge caveats before we get started. These are very, very true for everybody, so try to create a safe space. The first one, this stuff is hard for everybody. I spend my entire, like I spend all of my time bouncing around to lots and lots and lots of organizations. And I could probably count on two hands the number of organizations that I think are phenomenal at metrics and evaluation. The, the standard is that it is, it is hard and most organizations are not great at it. So, um, but this is exceptionally hard. So one, like, don't assume that you're gonna walk out of here an expert in this. This takes a lot of practice. Um, the second piece is that being lousy at this is kind of the norm for a while. This is not gonna change overnight. This is gonna require you to really think about your work in a different way. And like to get other people in your organization to get on board with that as well. Um, the third one is that even though this is hard, and even though that, like, the norm of this is to not be good, that actually makes a phenomenal opportunity. The organizations that are most effective at telling their story and raising money and recruiting staff members and recruiting amazing board members are ones that are great at doing this. 
So this is an amazing opportunity to differentiate your organization from all of the other organizations working on your issue area, in your geography, in your space. The more sophisticated and smarter you can get about what you do and why and how it works, the easier you're gonna find it to get all of the things that you wanna get that you think are, you're currently competing for. So let's talk a little bit like the 101 of what metrics are, so to the point of elements. This is a, I'm gonna to touch on a couple of key pieces here. This is a much deeper conversation. We run a four month class on this type of stuff. I don't expect that we're gonna cover all of it in the two hours we have today. Um, but feel free to interrupt with questions as you got them. So there's these three high level elements of what metrics are. There are inputs, there's outputs, and there's outcomes. Sound somewhat familiar to some of you? Right? Inputs, the things that we need to make the train go. So I like to use soup kitchens as an example. I used to work in a soup kitchen, I loved it, it's still where my heart is in a lot of ways. And it's a very simple model to think about. What are my inputs for a soup kitchen? Getting food. What else? Volunteers. Volunteers. Great. What else? Hungry people. Hungry people. What else? A site. A site. Some facility. Right? All of those things are needed. Those are the inputs in order to make the train go, to make everything work. Outputs. So outputs are the things that I immediately produce as a result of me using whatever those inputs are. So meals. Right? Any other outputs you can think of? That's a big one for sure. Some, some place of belonging, a safe place for the hour that somebody's sitting in there maybe. Okay, outcomes are the long-term impact that I'm having. What's my long-term impact for a, a soup kitchen? What am I striving for? Eliminating, Eliminating hunger, right? My outcome that I'm going for is eradicating hunger in my community. So those are the three high-level pieces, right? Inputs, what I need to make it work. Outputs, what I produce. Outcomes, why somebody should care, right? If my entire job was just to produce meals, that's a pretty uninspiring, not very impact-focused piece. If my job is to eradicate hunger, I happen to do that by, by, by serving meals. Um, getting to outcomes is usually, figuring out your inputs, very, very easy. Figuring out outputs, also usually pretty easy, right? Like the number of graduates you have from your program, things like that. Relatively easy to figure out. Outcomes is usually where it becomes incredibly hard. And so something that we really encourage organizations to think about is to think about indicators or proxies for that outcome. It's really hard for me to measure whether hunger has been eradicated in Sacramento. So I need to actually think about, okay, what are some of the indicators that that's happening? What should be happening as a result of me serving all of these meals and running the soup kitchen what should be happening as a result of my community that eventually can lead to eradicating hunger? So things like, all right, well, are the people that are coming here, are they signing up for like job training programs also through a partner of ours? Are they reporting more confidence and empowerment to be able to go do something? Do they feel safer now than they did before? Are they coming back time and time again? Are they actually finding other sources of food and able to actually get their own food secure? Right? I can do these on smaller scales, but I have to actually identify what it is I'm trying to track. Um, so I've got a little test for you. I've got two tests today. Here's the first one. Here are a bunch of different metrics I could track. Total number of program participants. Total number of spades or neuters. That's obviously not for the soup kitchen stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number of performances or exhibits. I think you do this. I'm curious, A through F, which of these do you think are really great metrics to track? Think about your own organization, think about a random organization. Which of these do you think are good? Which of these do you think are, are lacking? And why? Yeah? Um, D, number of attendees at a workshop. Great, because why? You've planned it, you want to get the information out. Um, and so having a full workshop and and giving the knowledge out. Okay. Any other thoughts? <coughs> yeah, John. Number of full-time staff, F. Number of full-time staff. Why is that a good metric to track? Because if you're successful, you will have staff to make it successful. If you're struggling, you'll be short staff. Okay, so John's seeing maybe the indicator there in the um, in staff members. Any other thoughts? The number of spay neuters. Number of spay neuters. Why is that a good metric to track? So 
So no, it's hard to hear. So it's saying the number of spay and neuters, because it tells you how much your program's actually doing and the impact that you're having. So it's a little bit of a trick question. I think these are all really crappy metrics, all of these. And there's something that they all have in common. These are all a moment in time with zero context around it. There's no context around any of these metrics. I can tell you a number for all of these, A through F, and what does that actually tell you? Most likely it's going to make you ask a lot of other questions or you're going to start making assumptions that are not true. So there's two types of metrics that I want to talk about. There are vanity metrics and there are management metrics. Vanity metrics are the ones that look real, real nice. Right? If I'm a soup kitchen, I've served a million meals. That's a really fun thing to say. I've served a million meals. What does that actually tell you about my organization? Nothing. Nothing. Right? I could tell you two really different stories that still has that same result. I've served a million meals. I just opened up January 2nd. Like, whoa, okay. I've served a million meals. I've been around since 1915. And we've served 900,000 of those meals in the first three years. And you're like, okay, what the hell have you done for the last 105 years? Oh, not much. Not much, but we've served a million meals. Right? I can have that same vanity metric, and it's... It's really misleading. They're really sexy, fun things to get to it. Like, you want to put them on the top of your brochure, right? On your annual report, we did da-da-da-da-da. And it's really easy to get drawn to them. They're marquee pieces. But they actually don't tell you any type of story. Management metrics talk about trend lines. Are things actually getting better? Are things getting worse? Am I getting smarter at doing this? Am I struggling on how to do this? So it's not thinking through like just the vanity metric of, okay, here's some random number with no context, but actually put a denominator on it. Or think about it over the span of time. Am I getting better at serving meals now than I was two years ago? Why? Am I more efficient at serving meals now than I was last year? Why? All of a sudden, I now have a story to tell, right? Is hunger increasing or decreasing in Sacramento? Why? What have my programs done to move the needle on that number? Why? Right? Management metrics are really, really valuable for a couple of reasons. One of them is they actually give you as managers of the organization information about what's working and what's not. So you can actually look at your programs and the decisions you've made and go, okay, the trend line of this is moving in the right direction. What major decisions did we make in the last year that enabled this? Those were good decisions. My trend line's moving in the wrong direction. What decisions or programs did I run in the last year? What changes did I make in my program? Something went wrong. I now know how to zero in on something and go, oh, I can fix this. They're also incredibly powerful for storytelling externally. Right? Me telling you how many spay and neuters I have or how many program graduates I have, it doesn't actually give me a story so much as trying to get people onto, this is moving in the really, really great direction I want you to join, or we're struggling and here's why we need help. We just had another, we had our, our primary in New Hampshire last night. You think about like trend lines and stories for you political junkies out there, right? The story that Joe Biden is telling is a very different story right now than stories that other candidates are telling. It's about trend lines. Am I moving in the right direction or am I moving in the wrong direction? It doesn't mean you need to fold up shop if things are going in the wrong direction. It means your narrative actually just needs to be fundamentally different. Um, okay, again, this stuff is incredibly complicated, but it, I want to stop and just ask, are there questions at this point? Okay, so second pop quiz. My example of the management metrics is also a really crappy metric. Can anybody spot why? So the example I had in the first one is we've served a million meals. The example I have in the second one is we served 35% more meals, um, sorry, than last year is what I'm supposed to say. say oh no, sorry, we served 35% more meals last year. So sorry, let's still keep that. That's still a lousy metric, not because it's telling a bad narrative, but there's something actually off on this metric. Anybody have an idea? We don't know how many you served. Okay, so the raw number's missing. Sure, maybe there's something there. But you know that something isn't going, right? like, there's something that's moving here. I'm serving less meals. Yeah. Well, again, it's the context. Um, you don't know whether because you're serving 35% less meals, you satisfactorily got from last year 
people moving on to self-sufficiency. Sure, right? There's a huge piece here that's missing. This could be working, I could serve 35% less meals because I've solved hunger for 35% of my community and so they don't need to come back. Or I'm actually just a really lousy soup kitchen and now there's two other soup kitchens that are much better and that's where everybody goes. This is not a great metric because if you go back to, to this, it's an output. The number of meals I serve is an output. The further south on this chart you can get with your metrics, the more powerful they're going to be. How has hunger changed in the last year is the metric I want to care about, and where my, where my narrative can really be anchored. When I think about the number of meals that I'm serving, I'm anchoring the entire narrative around an output. Outputs are uninspired. They're clear and they're easy to understand, but they're uninspired. Nobody gives you money in your organizations because they care about the outputs. They're giving you money because they trust that your outputs are leading to an outcome that they also want to see. But you have to help connect that dot for them. So I want you to spend a little time um, at your tables. If you're by yourself, grab a table with some other people here. Um, but I want you to start to think through what's working and what's not. You can think about it yourself for a second and then meet with the other people at your table. How are you currently approaching metrics and evaluation? What from what I just explained are you feel like you're already embodying really, really well? And where are there opportunities to get a little bit better? And what can you sort of start to think of as we're talking about these basics? Inputs, outputs, and outcomes. Vanity metrics and management metrics. What are some easy decisions you can start to make in your organization to get better about metrics and evaluation? So I'm going to give you a little time to think about that and talk at your tables. Um, we'll come back together and talk about this, and then I'm going to hand it off to Katie to talk about how to take that and actually start to build a narrative around it. All right, so we'll give you, a, we'll give you a five or six minutes at your tables. So I got a question during, the, during those conversations or comments saying like the vanity metrics, as we get into this, vanity metrics very easy to think of, right? Management metrics much, much, much harder. And there was a comment of saying, well, vanity, vanity sells. There's a reason, there's like a role for vanity and vanity metrics are very sexy things that can be really appealing in sell. And I will tell you, having seen this in many, many, many different organizations, pretty much every social issue you can possibly think of, vanity metrics are great at selling very, very small things. To have a transactional relationship with somebody, vanity metrics can be very effective. If you actually want to build a partnership with somebody, or with a foundation, or a donor, and you want them to invest in what you're doing, vanity metrics are going to keep that as a transactional relationship forever. Management metrics is what take that to a much deeper level, which gets you greater support, few extra digits on those checks, and much longer give back. <coughs> All of the people that you can think of in your space that are your biggest donors, my guess is they understand where things the trend line better than your small dollar gifts do. Probably not sure across the board, but for the most part, I would bet you that is true. Um, so as you can get deeper into management metrics and figure out how to shape narratives around it, it unlocks opportunity for much, like, much deeper engagement with your prospective donors and your community. Okay, I'm curious from your tables, um, what sort of came out? What are, what are things that you can, where do you think you're already doing this really well? Um, or what are things we think you can start to do moving forward to be better, better aligned with the best practices? This is the part where you talk. Taking <laughs> <laughs> broader, taking a more world view, rather than just how many kids were served, how many meals were served. Sure. So the comment is sort of taking our heads out of the weeds a little bit and stopping to think about like maybe what's directly in front of us and taking a more holistic view of the problem, right? What's actually happening with this problem overall? Um, and what does that mean and how does my organization there to fit into that? Uh, some hands in the back, yeah. So speaking for all of us a little bit, I think everyone is aware of the need to know these big picture ideas, but not really knowing where to find that information and how to, how to even know. Great, so the question of like, okay, I buy it theoretically, but on a day-to-day -day basis, how does that actually work? It's a really, really good question. I've got answers for you. Does anybody else have thoughts on this before I lay in? You're like, no, what's the actual answer? <laughs> um, okay, so this is where things get hard and it's not gonna be a plug and play. There's not some like website you can go to that's just gonna tell you all of your metrics without you putting in effort and work. So one of the things to do is if the overall outcome is too overwhelming, that's where thinking of indicators becomes really, really critical. Don't think about like, okay, let's eradicate hunger. Let's think of what are the things that need to happen with the people that are coming into my space 
for that likely to end up happening. Those of you that have heard me talk about theory of change in the past, this is theory of change. Those of you that don't know what that is, I apologize, we do not have enough time to get into it today, but I'm happy to talk to you about it afterwards. Um, so think of the indicators that are maybe a little easier to wrap your head around. And then you need to think in a really good, nonprofit, scrappy way, what is the quickest, cheapest way I can get some information on that? So doing you know, pre and post surveys can be a really valuable thing. Right? If I'm at my soup kitchen, I can have a quick questionnaire that's available there. Maybe one of my social workers can walk around the line and just interview people and kind of tally up some stuff. Maybe one of my partners is actually really good at data for the thing that they're tracking, and the indicator that they're tracking is the one that's really important to me. Right? You're not in this alone. Who are your organizational partners and what kind of capacity do they have? What kind of data do they have available? Um, the city is a great place to get data on certain types of so the county is a good place to get data on certain types of social issues. So I think like trying to think of like who are those other partners or where are those nodes of information is a really valuable thing. But then also don't overthink it and try to build this like amazing metrics and evaluation platform and a thing where now you have like randomized control trials and doing all sorts of like fancy academic style approaches to evaluation. We can get there. But first just think at like a really basic scrappy level. What's the easiest way I can get some type of indicator whether or not that's moving in the right direction? And how can I get enough data points that I can get convinced what I'm hearing is enough of a pattern that it's going to be applicable across my population? That's a lot easier to do than you think. Pre and post surveys is probably the easiest way to do it if you're working with a population that can actually engage that way. Um, other thoughts, other questions from your tables? Okay, this stuff is very, very hard. I know that. But it also is the major opportunity for you. If you look around here, we've got another session this afternoon. It is a very, very, very small percent of this population that is strong at metrics and evaluation in an organization. So if you can actually find a way to start to get some progress here and start to build narratives around it, it will make, it will differentiate your organization on things like the day of giving, end of your appeals, and just generally in the space. Become that organization that's getting smarter and smarter about how you do by thinking about outcomes, by getting smart about thinking about management metrics, and not getting caught up in the, we served a million meals, and that's my story. It's a very, very shallow, superficial story. Get deeper on it and trust your population to want to engage in those conversations. All right, we are going to take a five minute break. Um, there's going to be, we're going to head off to Katie after the break to get into how you actually start to build a narrative around this. Um, there's coffee in the back. If any of you, there's going to be a lot of writing, I believe, in the next session. If you don't have a pad of paper and a pen and you would like one, go see Monica in the back, who will give you a very nice, beautiful pad of paper and a pen. Um, otherwise, let's do five minutes and come back at 9.50. Thanks, everybody. Well, welcome back. So, like Jonathan, uh, my name is Katie McCleary, and um, I'm the founder of uh, 916 Inc., which is a nonprofit in Sacramento that provides creative writing classes to transform underserved youth into published authors who know the power of their own voice and the written word. Um, and I've presented a lot about storytelling, about how you communicate your messages on Big Day of Giving, and I am also, like Jonathan, doing something different this time. I'm gonna do kind of a deeper dive into what makes your narrative resonate with your particular audience. And uh, folding in also about how you communicate those metrics. So if you metrics. So if you thought that you were gonna come today and like write a narrative that you could go put into a funder or a grant proposal, that's not what's gonna happen today. <laughs> Sorry to say. But what is gonna happen today is that I hope I offer you some nuts and bolts about what makes a message or a narrative stick. How to frame that narrative using one of three appeals. How to understand, how to know your audience and your donors and what they want to know about in terms of your organization to give. And then all this stuff about you know, vanity metrics versus management metrics versus relational building, re relational um, interactions versus transactional interactions, it's the same sort of thing for me too, which is that in Big Day of Giving, you've got 24 hours to go after small potatoes, right? That is transactional. You are probably going to use a lot of vanity metrics and how you message Big Day of Giving. One, because you don't have a lot of time. 
right? It's sweet, short, in and out. But one of the purposes of these boot camps is to give you capacity building, to do that deeper dive, that more relational, um, the, more rela the, the stuff that's gonna make you more relational rather than transactional. And so Big Day of Giving is an enormous opportunity to get people into your swimming pool, into your party, right? And then to develop those relationships over time to get to deeper engagement, to get to management metrics, okay? And I'll echo what Jonathan said. I've been doing this work for a very, very, very long time. So 21 years I've been in the nonprofit education space, the funding space, the fundraising space, the grant writing space. I have probably done every single job that there is at a nonprofit. And it's really hard. And it's really, really hard to measure our impact in a way that is ethical, where we're not lying. We're not saying, oh my God, I'm a superhero and I save all the world's problems in my community. It's not that, right? So my presentation is a little bit about marketing, but it's also really about building that narrative too. Oh, there's a <laughs> So instead of calling it building the narrative, I'm going to call it communicating your impact. So, my challenge for you in this first part, just to get started, is I want you to think of a local organization that their messaging grabs you. I don't want you to talk about your own organization, right? And I want you to try to choose a nonprofit that you don't spend a lot of time in. So, think about the nonprofits in our region. What is one that you have a crush on? That's pretty much what I'm asking. What organization do you look at and go, oh my God, if only I had their budget, if only I had their marketing team, if only I had blah, 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 blah. Who do you have your crush on? So what I want you to do is I want you to talk to your table about their message and why it stands out to you. What is the story that they're telling? And what about that story makes you want to engage with them? So think about that. Take a few moments and you're going to um, talk about it at your group, and then I'm going to ask about two tables to share if they found any sort of common overlap. Think about message, feel, tone, graphics. Like, what do they do in communicating their impact that grabs you? Okay? Take five minutes. <laughs> all right, all right, we're going to come back. So, my question is I've been walking around and I've been asking everybody who their crush is. So, does any brave table want to kind of stand up and say, yeah, our crushes are these, and here's why we think their uh, communication strategies are catching us? Anybody want to talk? You guys got to fundraise at some point. Okay, here we go. Yes, what agency are you from? I have come from this international Davis. Yay, it loves to Raptimus. Raptimus gave me a bunch of money one year. <laughs> Woo! -hoo! I was just telling them. Okay. And then there, and then and then every year I can get a little chunk from them too. But one time I got. All right. So tell me about your guys' crushes. Who are they? I don't want to sound like the teacher's pet, but my example was the big day of giving. Woohoo! That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So what do we love about the big day of giving's message? Uh, I think the graphics are really colorful, they catch my eye. Um, it's relevant to me because it either reminds me of something that's on my to-do list or if there's information I need or a meeting I'm planning on coming to, it reminds me of that. And um, so it's very useful to me. Okay, so here's what I'm hearing. Useful, organized, clean, succinct, information, easy entry. Now, I'm gonna guess something. When I first meet you, are you are you want to be are you wanting to be approached with sincerity and warmth and hugs, or are you like to be approached with competency? What do I know, and how might we work together? How can you respect me? How do you like to be approached more with sincerity or with competency? I'm probably more of a competency person. No wonder you like the big day of giving. Very competent organization that we can trust to give us the right information. Thanks. Okay, I'm going over here. 
I'm choosing your table. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Allison. All right. What's up? Allison, what agency are you from? I'm with the Sacramento Children's Museum. Woo! Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Super fun. So. What What was your crush? So I said my crush was the SVCA because I love dogs and animals and they're just so cute, you know? <laughs> like, let's be honest. And I think something that I admire about them is the fact that they have such great video content. I think when we're scrolling on our news feeds, video really captures our eye. It makes us stop and watch. And, you know, for us, that's something we struggle with because, you know, not everyone wants their children to be in a video and things like that, you know? So, but I'm definitely one of those warm like comforting people on like the confident one, so. Ah. Yeah. So, yeah, as you just clearly heard, Allison, right, likes to be approached with sincerity. Warm, fuzzy cuddles, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Her heart has to attach first. Mm -hmm. That is another way in which we build trust as nonprofits. Okay, love that. So, gives you video, tells you what they need. Uh, let's see, we have another table? Yes, Marie. What agency are you from? I'm with Friends of Adopting Healthcare, and we support the Adopting um, Health Center in Lincoln. Thank you. That is really important. My sister is an adult with developmental disabilities and blind, and she goes to day programs all the time. Thank you. So, who's your crush? We have several. Okay. But one of them, um, which is close to home, is the Women Opera House. They um, they really engage the community. And they have a lot of support. It's like people are coming down their doors to help them out. Wow, so people really, really want to get involved with the Woodland Opera and House. So what is it about their communication and their storytelling do you believe is making people pound down their doors to get in? They've just provided good service for the community because they engage a lot of people in volunteer efforts. They provide an environment for the community to um, engage with the arts. Mm -hmm. And they, they're also um, uh, very, they, they, it's hard to describe, but they just know how to engage with people to help them. Yes. Okay, here's what I hear you saying, and I'm so happy you did this magically without me. I did not pay her to do this. <laughs> Over here, we have logos, table, logic, competency, trust, since, like, then over here, we have uh, pathos, which is warm, fuzzy, hearts, right? You were talking about ethos. Ethos is a presence of who you are, and often ethos is either me-centered or it's other-centered. Woodland Opera House is succeeding because I believe in what I hear you telling me. In their communication strategy, they are other community-centered. They're focusing on volunteers, patrons, artists. They're not saying, look at us, we're the Woodland Opera House, and this is what we do and what we do. We're saying, here's how you can engage. Here's how we transform community, and we need you to come and join us. And so when you said there's a kind of feel about them, that's ethos. That's presence. They have a presence in the community. And I bet that they're shining a light on their community instead of shining a light on their organization, which makes her want to get involved. Thank you, that was a much better narrative. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they pay me the big bucks. I got paid nothing. <laughs> Just kidding. So, all right. That brings me to my next point. We're gonna go back to college. We're gonna talk about Aristotle. So when you're building a narrative, Jonathan talked about that you have to kind of find a framework, right? in order to tell your story. So when you're communicating your impact, we really make three different appeals. Ethos, pathos, logos, okay? Nonprofits only exist because of public trust. Trust is everything, right? We are managing public dollars and donations. So when we introduce stories and narratives to communities, to donors, to funders, to the news, the media, all the audiences that we are engaging, right? We're gaining that trust. How do I know that my money is gonna go to that, right? Because the media 
loves to tell stories about when nonprofits go awry. We all know that, right? And it builds distrust in the public sphere. And there's all this thing about, well, how do I know if I give them $10,000? What are they going to do with that $10,000? And are they doing X, Y, and Z? Like, we are under much more scrutiny than any other organization out there. So how we build trust is through building relationships with our presence and our messaging. Presence is ethos. It's the feeling of your agency. Another way to say it is that it's like a brand personality, right? Messages have personalities. So I'm gonna have you hold in your head for a moment that there are three appeals that you can make as a nonprofit to build trust and communicate your story. Ethos, pathos, logos, okay? But I wanna deepen into your ethos for just a moment and talk about the fact that you have a brand personality. And the nonprofits that we heard about who we have crushes on, they definitely have a brand personality, okay? The first one is sincerity. How does my message come across if I'm a sincerity-based organization? Right? I'm down to earth, I'm honest, I'm wholesome, I'm cheerful, sentimental. The other one is excitement, right? Let's, let's pause. Let's think about one, let's think about a nonprofit in our community that feels small town, down to earth, honest, wholesome, and cheerful. I can think of one immediately off the top of my head. Anybody else got one? Where you're like, that's that organization's brand. Where's food literacy? Yeah. Woohoo! If you don't know food literacy, food literacy's personality is very much in the sincere, wholesome, cheerful category. If you've looked at food literacy's branding and communications and the stories that they tell, wholesome and cheerful, man. Sacramento homegrown. Next one, excitement. Ooh, it's daring and trendy, exciting, spirited, cool, young, imaginative, up to date, right? They're like scooping up millennials into their cause. Sucks because millennials don't have a lot of money. <laughs> is there a nonprofit in this community that says that is their brand personality? Who? The LGBTQ Center. Ah, what makes them? Like, like what about their feel of their messaging adds to that? Um, it's very much about helping the young people and about helping the young people who are other. Yeah. And I think that their, uh, their graphics are catching and bright and um, their audience is not too far off from people that they serve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're doing all kinds of cool things actually to gain a lot of attention. They have their gay men's chorus that goes out and they'll do like random um, street singing and stuff like that. So one of the ways that they're showing their impact through that messaging is they are out loud and proud, right? Rainbows, flashy, everywhere, accept us, we are here, and here's how we're changing our community. That is definitely that brand. Competency, reliable, hardworking, secure, intelligent, successful. Give me a nonprofit that fits that bill in this town, that their presence is like that. Sorry, the green says competence, reliable, hardworking, secure, intelligent, you know, you could say that that would be the Crocker Art Museum, it could be Weave, Weave has this presence about them too, right? They tend to be larger institutions that have been around a little bit longer. Any of the foundations in our community? Foundations, definitely. Mm -hmm. so those would be like the big day of giving one. All right, the next one is sophistication. Upper class, glamorous, good looking, charming, feminine, smooth. We could say that one's the Crocker Art Museum too. <laughs> could be like KVIE. They've got a little excitement, right? I mean, these things also do kind of blend. It's not like you just stick in your box, but you primarily have a box. And then the last one, which I know is hard to see, is ruggedness. Outdoorsy, masculine, western, tough, and rugged. What would that be? What organization lives that sort of brand personality? 
Placer Land Trust, Sacramento Splash, right? So a lot of the outdoor and environmental programs sort of fit that. So when you think about your ethos, really think about your organization as having kind of a brand personality and identity. It is your presence. As an organization, it is how you show up. And it's one of the very first ways in which you begin to build trust with an audience. Okay. We're gonna go back to the building trust thing. So there's two ways that you can kind of frame up, right? A narrative. And this is really about you knowing your audience and your donors. So I walked around the table and I said, what crush do you have, right? We talked about competency and sincerity. When we're building trust, we build trust in the first 15 seconds. You're like, how does this have to do with storytelling, Katie? It has everything to do with storytelling. So as fundraisers, we're constantly approaching people, people we know and people we don't know, right? The brain builds trust in the first 15 seconds by asking two questions. Can I trust you, right? Which is, can I respect you? Can I see you? And what's funny is that your brain will go to one of those two questions first. Can I respect you is what do you know that I maybe don't know. The minute that your brain figures that one out, it will immediately go to the next one, which is basically how can I see you, how can I connect with you, and that's the sincerity one. There's been a lot of research done on this, in particular by a woman named Amy Cuddy. And Amy Cuddy wrote a book called Presence. And basically her whole entire research, she's a Harvard social psychologist, her whole entire research is really off this adage that we often talk about in society, which is, what, which is, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. She built her whole research off that. Why do some people get hired, and why do some people not get hired? It's really about how you show what? Your ethos, right? The things that we just waft off of us, and they can be intentional, right? We create logos and branding and language and all the stuff around it, but it's how you show up. So in her research, in her book, it is 50-50 split in the United States. Half of our nation wants to be approached with competency. What do you know? Can I trust you? What's the data? Half of the population wants to be approached with sincerity. Good, warm, fuzzy feelings. Are you a good, moral, ethical person? Now, we are in the nonprofit sector. We are at the whim of our own group think. Most of us are sincerity people in the nonprofit sector. We're in it to feel good and to change lives, right? A lot of funders live in the competency sector. A lot of donors live in the sincerity sector. For the big day of giving, you're making a lot of sincerity approaches with a lot of vanity metrics because you're doing that quick grab, right? Just get you into my funnel, get you into my organization so I can build a relationship with you that will deepen over time and then will become more relational and then they'll be invested in your management metrics. So if you think about it this way, right? Sincerity is qualitative. When we say qualitative data, we're talking about the stories, the anecdotes, right? The stuff that we can't easily quantify with numbers. It's still data. People say, oh, well, anecdotes aren't data. Well, they can be data if you frame up your narrative correct to show the change that you're making in the world through that anecdote. So it's qualitative data, it's rooted in story, and it's often rooted to a singular person. One story for me to connect with. Competency, which is the other 50%, right? You're talking about quantitative data. Break it down for me, what are the numbers? Oh, you served 35% more meals last year. Great, that context is so important though to a competency person, which is a lot of what the funders are doing and that leap from donor to funder, right? You're a big day of giving, I'm gonna guess that 90% of the people who give to you on the big day of giving, they're just giving to you $15, $25, $150, right? To me, those are donors. At some point, a donor becomes a funder when they begin to make a major gift to your organization. 
You define what is a major gift for your organization. A major gift for my organization when I was running 916 Inc. was anything over $5,000. So when somebody indicated to me that they were gonna give me $5,000, I really tried to deepen that relationship. And you're like, well, why weren't you deepening the relationships with the $25 donors? That's mean, Katie. I don't have enough time, <laughs> right? So then it becomes about telling my story in a much more compelling way with them because I'm bringing them into my work as a partner. How can we improve this together? It's not about vanity and marketing anymore, right? It's about, I have real challenges and here's what we're trying to solve. It's direct, meaning that stories, right? A little bit more whimsical, a little bit more imaginative. You get to put in a lot more sort of colorful language and figurative details and make that come alive. This is a more direct messaging. I know this, this, and this, and here's why. And it's really organizational based, not client or person centered. It's about the story of a system, of a whole. So one of the things that I want you to really think about is who is your audience? On Big Day of Giving, you're probably gonna make a lot of sincerity, vanity, metric based asks, right? But if you come from an organization and you know that the majority of your donors who give you major gifts or big gifts, or even if they're gonna make a gift on a big day of giving that's bigger, you're not gonna go at them with your sincerity campaign. You're gonna go at them with your competency campaign, right? You put that data up front. Somebody tell me, oh, well, I'm sure Mr. John Holmes knows. What is the golden rule, John? The golden rule. Do unto others as you want them to do unto you. Absolutely. Good job. What's the platinum rule? <laughs> yes. Treat others as they want to be treated. Treat others as they want to be treated. That is sales 101. But we live in a world where we kind of have our blind spots on us. Because I'm a sincerity person, and I like videos of tumbling little dogs and cats, I might mistakenly build my entire nonprofit's campaign based off of what I like and how I want to be approached. So much of this is just not about you. It's not about you. Even though you're doing the hard work every single day and toiling and not getting paid enough, it's not about you. It's about them and how they want to be approached and what they want to hear. So when you're framing a narrative, you need to be really clear about who your audience is and what do they care about. How do they want to be approached? And like I said, right, you approach them with this and then you get to move and shift into the other one. So if they want to be approached with competency, you start with competency and your data and then you shift back into sincerity and an anecdotal story that helps illuminate the competency argument you just made. Then you just flip it if it's the other one. Start with sincerity, oh my gosh, let me tell you about what happened when little Susie came into our program today, right? Talk, 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 talk about little Susie and her change, take a step back and shift, because now they're waiting for it, they're tired of hearing the story. Did you know we serve 35 Stu Susies a day? And that Susie is facing a literacy crisis because two thirds of Sacramento children can't read at grade level by fourth grade. Here's what we're doing to move that needle on literacy and then you go into your management metrics. So it's not that you're just choosing one, but you're predominantly framing up and teeing up at the beginning one clear strategy. <coughs> and then you shift and blend in the second. So is there an impact formula? I mean, does this Aristotle translate into some sort of common fundraising thing that you may have heard before, right? Ethos, pathos, logos. Does anybody want to translate that to maybe something they've heard before about how you get donors to give to you? Anybody come to my session last year? I often teach it from Yes, Alicia knows. Head, heart, wallet. How many of you heard of this before? 
hit him in the head with data, then you move to the heart story and you tug on their heart, and then you move to the ask, which is getting them to open up their wallet and give to you. The problem, I've been teaching that for a very long time. The deeper engagement in, was the time framing of the problem, is that, right, you need to understand, do you start at the heart first and then move to the head, or do you start at the head and move to the heart? But as a fundraiser, let's be really clear, at the end of the day, you are asking for time, talent, or treasure. You have to be queued up for an ask. You have to know what you're going to ask. So let's break down these appeals a little bit more. A logos appeal, or the brain head appeal, the competency appeal, right? Number driven, organization focused. It's educational. A lot of these things you'll hear, did you know, did you know that two thirds of Sacramento third graders can't read at grade level? And if they can't read at grade level, they're 90% likely to be, or 75% likely to uh, drop out of school, uh, to get pregnant, and to continue a cycle and chain of poverty, right? So it's educational. I'm teaching you something about this problem that we're trying to solve. Really gets at Jonathan's manage management matrix. Metrics. It's usually linear. A logos appeal is linear. It's formulaic, like we have this problem, here's how we solve it, and then this occurs. Kind of boom, 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 right? And it kind of has an investor feel to it. How am I investing in this organization? And what's my return on investment gonna be if I give them that donation? What change will I see in the world because of that? That's how that one kind of feels. A pathos narrative is story driven. Anecdotes. There's so many examples of this. If you were to hashtag BDOG2019 from last year into your Facebook, right? All of these hashtags are gonna pop up of all the sort of campaigns that happened last year for Big Dog. A lot of them do this. Like here's a picture um, of an elephant who was a circus animal that a wildlife rescue was able to save and let this elephant live out the last of its years in comfort, not traveling in a circus and entertaining. I think that was the Wild Paws Rescue. It was a really good post. They kind of do that. It's like a story. And they, they did it in about three sentences. Picture of an elephant hanging out, looking like it's relaxing, finally. Story-driven, anecdotes, person-based, client-focused. This is where things get really tricky. Do you have permission to tell your client's story? You have to be ethical about it. Protect their privacy, right? Get their permission ahead of time. Often a lot of people will make up characters, like a client composite, right? And which is true because if you're serving, let's say you serve 3,500 people a year and they kind of all come from you know, a various demographic, you could probably build a character or a client to talk about that was a composite of sort of the struggles and the rewards that those individuals were facing. Even then though that's tricky because clients might come back to you and try to read into the story and be like, well you used me there. It doesn't happen very often. But it's client focused. So also know in this one, do you have permission to tell the story of change and impact? It's emotional, totally emotional. It's creative, right? So maybe not so linear. You get to have a lot more liberties with it to hook people. And it has a hero and a heroine sort of thing. So an investor, right? is like come and invest and you're going to get this return on investment and you're going to help me save the world. In this one, your client, the, the donor, right, or the funder, it's like a hero or a heroine narrative. You're going to help me save this, right? Not thinking like an investor. Thinking more of a hero or a heroine. If you help me, we can do this. Ethos. So P.S., you can't escape your ethos. You already have a presence, whether or not you're aware of it. 
Your organization has a presence. You personally have a presence. So you can't get rid of it. You can't zip it off. You can improve it. You can break trust also pretty easily in a nonprofit environment if you don't pay attention to your presence or what's being said about you in a way. So ethos, right, it's trust driven. Because as a nonprofit, if I'm looking at sort of who you are and if I'm gonna give to you, can I trust you again to use my money the right way? It is your presence, like I said. It's your brand personality focus. You won't be able to zip off your presence. It's just the look and the feel of your organization. It's how somebody, it's window dressing. It's how somebody enters in. So really think about that. It's peer, inclusive, and belonging. People will come to you because of their ethos, because they're attracted to you in some way. It's like we were talking about the, the, the Woodland Opera House. I don't know, there's just a feel about them. I just want to be a part of it, right? How does your presence, your brand personality, invite people in the door? And are they inviting the right kind of people? It's value and mission alignment. So while it might not be you know, um, creative or linear, what we're looking here to read into is how does your funder or your donor align with your value and your mission? And then it's solving it together. Organizations too often, when they're telling their story, they're all me, 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 I, 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 I. We, 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 right? I once talked to, um, at a big doc training a couple years ago, one of the things was like, okay, turn to your partner and tell them the most exciting work that you're doing right now. And he was a young man, like 23, it was probably his first development fundraising job. And he went first, and I don't know what organization he was from, but they were building a building, right? So he's working on a capital campaign. He's going on and on and on about this building that they're building, and it's so exciting. He never once told me what he did, what his agency did, what the mission was, why they were building the building, or what would happen in the building. He's in a narrow tunnel, right? His job is build the building, get people excited about the building, but forgetting that the building is just an input to a long-term outcome of change. We do that all the time. And if you don't believe me, do it again. Go back into Facebook, BDOG 2019 hashtag. I'm going to tell you that what I saw last night when I was scrolling through, just looking at them, that's why I have no examples up here for you. Because one, I would be calling out an organization and saying they didn't do it right. I'm not going to do that. But it's a lot of that. It's a lot of me, 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 I, 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 we, we, we. Never actually placing it, here's how you can help. Here's the focus on how we're changing our community. Focus on you. Platinum rule, not golden rule. We just get really stuck in our own little silos excited about what we get excited about, right? So this one in your ethos should have an ethos of we're solving it together. It's not just me here slaving away and doing all this work and I need you to pay me so that I can feed my family and keep going to work. So the story-based communication recipe, I used to teach it as head, heart, wallet, over and over again, head, heart, wallet, head, heart, wallet, right? Some mashup of the two. It's still the same, right? Pathos, egos, logos. But I really want you to think about, and what, you know, Jonathan's saying, let's deepen this, right? Let's not just, like, let's get beyond vanity, right? Let's deepen it. And my deepening for you is to really think about your presence as an organization and how you build trust and how you're framing your narrative and your data. Rather than me coming in to say today and saying, everybody, we're gonna, we're gonna make a Facebook post and now we're gonna make a Twitter post. You know how to do that. <coughs> so, every story has these three things. A story is not a story without conflict. There's always conflict in a story. A lot of people wanna argue with me about that. I have 20 years on you. Mm -mm. Every story has conflict, always. 
It's always a call to action. There's always a rub. There is something that has to change. That is the definition of a story. So, man against man, man against himself, man against the world. That's a story. So, in the beginning, there's a conflict. Right up front, don't bury the conflict. Don't give a bunch of backstory, just conflict. Now, this conflict needs context, which is what Jonathan was talking about. I need to know the context of where this conflict is coming from. That can happen on the micro level or the macro level. Macro would be like big, big problems, solving hunger. Micro could be, I run a community center in Meadowview and I provide all these opportunities because Meadowview as a community doesn't have these things to help support a thriving community. It's a littler, right? So, but it's both. There's always a micro and a macro context. Jonathan says the denominator. What are you trending like over time, right? So when you start off, we're solving this problem because, and here's why it exists. Always a context. Then things happen. There's a conflict, then things happen, right? The things that happen are your inputs. We do that. With that, there's always a set of challenges. No story is like, here's the conflict, and then we did this, and it solved it. Hooray! <laughs> That's not how stories work. It's not how humanity works. It's, I have a conflict. I'm trying to figure out how to solve it. Okay, I made some progress. Oh my God, something bad just happened two steps back. Okay, I'm learning again. I'm going forward. Ah, oh, side swiped with another problem. Two steps back, right? Eventually, over time, we are victorious. But it's never just problem solved, figured it out, right? So what are the inputs? What are the challenges, right? So if you think about, uh, let's say you run um, Wind Youth Center, right? Immediate crisis. Young person is going to experience homelessness. Where are you going to go? <coughs> they have their own sets of challenges. Now they're in the world. How do they navigate? Where do they go? Where do they find shelter? How are they going to get their paperwork? How are they going to do X, Y, and Z, right? Luckily, wind is there. Wind provides a bunch of inputs to those challenges. But do the clients always follow protocol? They always do everything you wanted to do, right? Oh, if I follow the plan. They don't follow the plan, they're young people, right? Lots of mistakes and challenges. And the organization is also having lots of challenges too, right? Then you learn stuff from all the challenges. You learn stuff so we get a little smarter, a little better, right? and then we have an output, and then we have change. That is the roadmap of a story. It follows the hero's journey, for any of you Joseph Campbell fans. This is a story, it follows the bell curve, right? English class 101. It's the same thing here. Don't be afraid to talk to your donors and funders about what your challenges are. That's your ask. Right? If you don't tell them what your challenges are and your vanity metrics are just, we served 5,000 kids this year, woohoo! Help us serve 5,000 more. Right? We really want to be able to serve 6,000 kids this year, but we have some significant challenges to increase our investment by 20%. If we, if we serve 1,000 more kids, here's all the ways in which we're going to be challenged and let's solve it together. And here's my ask of you for your time, your talent, or your treasure. Okay. So really the impact formula of how you're going to frame your narrative or think about your narrative is that you're going to choose a logos or a pathos appeal to start with, right? A logos or a pathos appeal based on your audience's preferences. For the big day of giving, how you speak to the Facebook audience might not be the same as you speak to the LinkedIn audience. What does Facebook want? They want, fuzzy. They want what? Warm and fuzzy. They want warm and fuzzy. They want sincerity, right? 
What does LinkedIn want? Competency. You're like, but I love Hootsuite, and I love creating one post, and then that post goes to all of the social media channels, Katie. It's a four for one. Yeah, well, you might not be getting a lot of donors from LinkedIn, or a lot of board members that you're trying to nab, or companies you're trying to sponsor you, right? It's a different conversation. It's a different narrative. So, based off your audience preference, but also what I just said, who do you want to start showing up? Do you want to start having people show up who can write you $25,000 checks? Or do you want to keep having the people show up who write you $25 checks? For me, I built 916 Inc. off of people who give $15, $25. So I love the $15 to $25 people. But it was so exciting when the $25,000 people started walking through the door. But I had to get smart about how to fish for them. You're fishing. What lure and bait do you need to get the fish you want? And then you already have fish, what do they already want to eat? So, then you use the best of your ethos. You can't get rid of your ethos. Use the best of your ethos. Everything you have about your presence, your branding, your metrics, right? Your look, your feel, who you are, why people want to belong to you and engage to convey your measured change. So I'm gonna read that again. The impact formula is about choosing a logos or a pathos appeal based off your audience preference or who you're trying to fish for. And use the best of your ethos, your presence, right? To convey your measured change. And for big dog and fundraising, making a time bound specific ask that will help resource and further your impact. Help, she cried. Help, 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 help. Then Linus comes in. This is a very boring story, <laughs> right? Oh, I'll just add another help. So conflict in the beginning, things happen, challenges, lessons are learned. Right? Change happens. Positive change will happen. If positive change doesn't happen, we don't want to be stuck in conflict. We are always rooting for the underdog. It's wired in us. So, I said Third Plateau gave you a stunning example about the soup kitchen. So, it was really stunning, Jonathan. <laughs> it was just the best ever. Um, knowing what you know now about vanity metrics versus management metrics, how might you choose a logos or a pathos appeal and write me a big day of giving Facebook post that offers your donors insight into a trending change that you've tracked over time? You're like, but I don't have my trending change and I just got introduced to it. I don't have it. We don't, we don't do any evaluation or measurement in my organization, right? You're going to do the best you can. So I want you to write a Facebook message for a big day of giving using one of these appeals. <coughs> and then we're going to share. OK? Three sentences. I'm asking you to write three sentences. <coughs> Okay, we're going to take about five to seven minutes. I'm going to gauge by the scribbling. Okay, so for the next part, I'm going to ask some people to share what they wrote. And it's a first draft. You've had utterly no time to make any strategic decision at all or revision to what you wrote. So I'm not going to critique it, and you're not going to critique it. We're just going to read it, and we're going to talk about what's working well, what resonates with you, right? And my major, major tip and takeaway is that I want you to really start studying how stories work. And I want you to start studying other organizations and how they're doing their messaging. And think about what their brand personality is. What is their ethos? What is their presence, right? Really start deconstructing that. And then if you're a person who gets blocked 
easily when writing. Like, I don't know where to start, I don't know where to begin, I hate it, right? And I'm gonna tell you, this is the majority of people, I've been teaching writing for 20 years. Majority of you all hate it. Because you don't know where to start and begin. What you need to do is I want you to take a campaign or a message that another nonprofit wrote that you really like, that is similar somewhat to your agency or your mission, and I want you to use it like a formula. And every word they write, like, Placer Land Trust believes in wild spaces. Okay, okay. 916 Inc. believes in magical kids. Okay, period. Literally, use it like a formula. Plug and play. Give yourself permission to do that, please. The more you give yourself permission to basically copy someone's formula, the more authentic and specific it will become to you and you can fix it in revision to make it more nuanced and fitting with your message and your brand. It's a great place to start. At 916 Inc. with kids to get them writing when they're so obstinate about writing, sentence starters, fill in the blanks. It's Mad Libs, you're mad living. Just do it. Okay, who wants to share? Yes, John. In recent years, the Camellia Symphony Orchestra has improved the enthusiasm of its musicians and its audience by focusing its programming on feedback from patrons and focusing on improving local musicians' competency. Nice! John's from the Camellia Symphony Association. So what I like about that post a lot, right? Attention to what we're focusing on improving. I could have had one more little line in there. There was a moment you had a word about patrons, like we're, we're expanding appreciation in the community, right? With patrons like you. Put it back on them. Patrons like you, join the cause, be with us, be together. What else did somebody like about that? Post. What was it focused on? Sincerity, competency. Sincerity, right? But also competency. We are learning. We are doing this. There was a little bit of both in there. Thanks, John. Who else would like to share a Facebook post? They're going to write for Big Day of Giving. Okay. I need a lot of help. No, you don't need any help. I love, I love this. I didn't have enough time to finish it off, but this is what I have. Okay. Um, during the last year, the Yolo Adalte Health Center supported over 75 community members in need of care. However, there are still members waiting to attend the center. Please help us remove this waiting list and support our capital campaign fund. Awesome. I'm going to read that aloud one more time so everybody can hear it. During the last year, the YADHC supported over 75 community members in need. However, there are numbers waiting to attend the center. Please help us remove the waiting list and support our capital campaign fund and to expand the center's reach. Nice job, right? Is there conflict in there? Is there a call to action? Is there a data point? Right? She hit all of those things. I would say that that's actually almost a competency appeal. Really, kind of putting the number up there first and then help us get off the wait list. It's not like we dropped into a story of a person who is waiting to get care, right? We didn't drop into a story of one of the lucky 75 who were supported. So it's really more of an organizational competency one. Nice job. What's another one? For young adults graduating from high school, or for young adults graduating from high school means a world filled with possibilities. For parents of children with autism, graduation means a time of fear. What will my child do next? With a 75% unemployment rate for adults with dis disabilities, this is where it gets a little messy, like the fear is real. <laughs> um, over the last year, Southside Unlimited has supported 25 recent graduates with autism to find a job. At Southside, all dreams are worth pursuing. That was awesome. That was 
was really, really good. What did we learn in that post? What do you like about it? What's going to stay with you? What will you remember? The facts, right? She gave it into the bigger picture, setting forth that conflict in a context. 75% unemployment rate for my population, right? How did it open, though? Did it open in doom and gloom? How was it teed up and framed in the, in the first? Well, saying how high school uh, graduation is a time of promise for, for the most of the population. So it was positive, it was uplifting. And, but for those with autism, mm -hmm. there's a 75 unemployment rate. Mm -hmm. Educational, but also got you to that place of, oh yeah, I've taken that for granted. Yeah. Sort of pushing it back on me a little bit. So it opened in a place of positivity and then the shoe dropped immediately in the second sentence. Yeah. yeah. Nice job. And then, I and then always think about what graphic you attach to your big day of giving post, right? And there's a balance. The picture represents a story. It doesn't need to be repeated in the text. They complement each other. So I could see having graduation hats up in the air, I could see diplomas, celebration, all that kind of stuff, right? What about any questions for me before we wrap up? Yeah? Are you available for tutorials? Am I available for <laughs> tutorials? Yes, I am. My card's up front. Okay. Yeah. I really do suggest that you take a night when you're just sitting on the couch and I want you to type in Big Dog 2019, the hashtag, and literally look at people's campaigns, okay? I want you to find your crush and you're gonna go use it like a Mad Libs. Print out what they're doing, plug in your own language, and then play around with it. Don't sit there and go, ugh. There's a lot to play with and repurpose and use. So, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Raise a lot of money.